Dear God, I thank you for this time together here this morning. And Father, as we come into your word, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to your truth and help us to grab hold of that truth. And Father, be encouraged by it. Um, God, thank you for all that you are to us. Jesus, uh, thank you for this incredible passage that tells us about you, um, that one who went to the cross for us. Uh, God, just have your hand upon us here this morning. Help us, uh, again, to, to just um, understand what you have for us in these truths. And Father, help us to apply our hearts to them, we pray. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, Isaiah 53 is where we are headed here this morning. We're going to be looking at a passage there. And as we prepare to get in that passage, I want to just um, share with you. Okay. Kevin, we're not having an advancement of this slides there. Technology is always so great, isn't it? <laughs> Until it doesn't work. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right. So um, just as we prepare to get in here, you may have heard the story of a Sunday school teacher who decided to see how much her class, her kiddos, uh, knew about the true meaning of Easter. And so she asked them, um, what does Easter mean? Well, one little girl raised her hand, and she, the teacher said, Yes, Sarah, what does Easter mean? And Sarah said these words, Easter is when all of my aunts and uncles come to my house and eat turkey, <laughs> watch football, and take naps. Well, the teacher said, No, Sarah, I'm sorry, that's Thanksgiving. Well, another student raised his hand. Yes, Billy, the teacher said. Billy said these words, last Easter we decorated a tree, hmm. sang songs, got lots of presents, he answered. No, Billy, that's Christmas, the teacher said. Well, finally, little Emily confidently stood up, raised her hand and said, I know, I know. And here's what Emily said. Easter is a special day to remember that Jesus was hung on a cross, that he died and was put in a tomb for three days. The teacher said, Whew. all right, that's very good, Emily. And then Emily continued on, and she said these words. And on the third day, everyone gathers around the tomb, Emily said. And then they wait to see if Jesus comes out and he sees his shadow. <laughs> and that means six more weeks of winter. The teacher said, class dismissed. <laughs> well, of course, that's a, a made-up story, but... It reminds us that sometimes people just don't get the real meaning of Easter, right? So many times people are out there and say, well, well, Easter is just like Thanksgiving, or Easter is just like Groundhog Day. No, it's so much more. Easter is about hope. Easter is about the resurrection. Easter is about the fact that Jesus died for our sins on the cross, was buried, and then three days later raised again, and, and now we have that hope of eternal life, and that's what Easter is about. Well, today we are going to look at the one who made Easter possible. We're going to look at Jesus and his prophecy there in Isaiah in chapter 53. Isaiah 53 is, is, a, is a chapter that's filled with prophecy about Jesus who comes to this world of ours, dies on a cross, takes our sins upon him, and offers up a sacrifice to God the Father, a holy God, so that we might have a life of forgiveness, so that we might have a life of hope. So we're going to look at that passage here this morning, and as we continue, oh, oh here we go. Jesus was uh, given many names, and we're going to find out about a name here in Isaiah chapter 53, and here are some of those names. I think I don't have control, do I? Okay, all right. Okay, here's some of the names. You can go ahead and, and pull up those names. There's about six of them there. Lion of the tribe of Judah, Alpha and Omega, the King of Kings, Emmanuel, God with us, the Word of Life, the Bread of Life, the Living Water, and then one more, the Light of the World. Actually, that's just a sampling of some of those names of Jesus in the Scriptures. And those are names that, that are awesome names, right? We love those names. I mean, who doesn't like the name Emmanuel, God with us? We know that God is right here with us. God is with us in this world of ours. He's not some distant God. He's a very real and personal God. And the lion of the tribe of Judah, boy, that just, that just reminds us that, hey, he's, he's a mighty God, right? 
He is a mighty God and he has all power that belongs to him. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is like, wow, those are awesome names. But then Jesus is given another name and we find it here in Isaiah in chapter 53. The name that Jesus gives is a name that maybe we're not so excited about, okay? And the name that we're not so excited about maybe is this one. Wow. Man of Sorrows. Man of Sorrows. Now that name is like, well, that's not exciting. <laughs> that's not like, real encouraging, right? Oh, but it is. And we're going to find out about that name here today. So, yeah, some names are really exciting. Some names we can really connect with. But this man of sorrows, this is a name in Isaiah chapter 53. And it's really a, a name that, that talks about the sorrows that Jesus experienced as he died on the cross. Here's the name there in Isaiah 53, verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. That's where the name comes out of Isaiah in chapter 53. So what's in this name, this man of sorrows that is given to Jesus? Well, as you can already guess, it's a name of suffering. It's all about his suffering. It's all about him going to the cross and dying for our sins. And he was despised, we see in the rest of the passage there. He was rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Then we go on in that passage in Isaiah. Yet we esteemed him stricken. He was smitten by God and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement, chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Very clearly we see the suffering that comes through this name. Interestingly enough, when you see that word, he was pierced for our transgressions. This is such an amazing prophecy. Remember, it's telling us about what was coming in Jesus' life. Now, Jesus wasn't even born yet. He was in existence. He's been from eternity past. He was with God in the beginning but here he came to this world of ours, but before he came to this world of ours, here we have this prophecy hundreds of years earlier that tells us how Jesus was going to die. The piercing made reference to the crucifixion. Jesus being crucified on the cross, Jesus being nailed to the cross, and that piercing for our transgressions. Very, very interesting. And by the way, the Romans haven't even thought of the crucifixion yet at this time in history, and, and it wasn't a Jewish thing at all either. So even before it was even thought of how Jesus would die, God's saying this is how it's going to happen. He's going to be pierced. So here we have this, this passage in Isaiah chapter 53 of Jesus looking ahead into the future and seeing how he was going to die. He is a man of sorrows, we are told. Well, I want to take just a little bit of time and talk about Jesus' final hours. And we're going to look at how it all transpired. Late evening, we find that, that Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he takes his disciples with him and he, and he prays there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And his heart is just wrenched with, with that, what is about to happen. Jesus was not going to shy away from it. No, not at all. He was going to go through that suffering for you and I. He was going to take your sins and my sins upon himself. He was going to do that. But in the garden, he falls down on his knees. He prays and he cries his heart out to God. And he prays so heartily, or so uh, drastically and, and, and so deliberately that we see in one passage even that he begins sweating as if blood was coming from his sweat pores. So Jesus begins praying in the garden that evening, and then there's, at midnight, there's the betrayal and the rest of Jesus. One of his very own disciples, Judas, 
who spent three years with Jesus along with the other 11 disciples, he betrayed Jesus and he brought the Jewish leaders to where he knew Jesus would be praying with his disciples. And there he was betrayed and he was arrested. And then at 1 a.m., thereabout, he stands before Annas. And then from 2 to 5 a.m., he is taken to the high priest and he is basically put on trial by the Jewish leaders. And this is all, again, happening in the middle of the night. Then by 6 6 to 7 a.m., the council plans to execute Jesus. They take him to Pilate. Pilate then sends him away, and then he's brought back to Pilate a second time. Pilate finally deems him guilty, and then he's taken off, and he's brutally, brutally flogged. Do you know what flogging is? We've talked about it before. It's not just a little whip, like maybe you got down at Connor Prairie when you were a kid and on a field trip. Um, maybe, maybe you have some sort of an inkling of a, of a horse whip or a pig whip or <laughs> whatever it might be. But no, this is a whip very specially designed by the Romans with pieces of metal that literally ripped the flesh off of a back Every time that whip came down, whip, whoosh, flesh ripped off. Whip, flesh ripped off. Brutal, brutal. Then Jesus is taken and nailed to the cross about 9 a.m. that morning, on that Friday. They nailed him to the cross, and there he was on the cross. And then at 12 o'clock noon, darkness comes over the land on that area. And it's showing this, this judgment of God upon sin, this symbol, symbolic darkness. And then, then at 3 p.m., Jesus finally breathes his last breath. He gives up his spirit, and he says these words, it is finished. What is it, what's finished? What was it that's finished? It wasn't Jesus' is finished. It was that his work was finished to die for your sins and my sins on a cross. Jesus had work to do, and that work was to get us back right with God, get us connected back with God. By the way, when Jesus was nailed on the cross, it wasn't necessarily the nails that were the bad thing, although they were horrible. It wasn't necessarily the the flogging that was bad, and it it was horrible. It was the fact that he was suffering the judgment that you and I should have got. And when the Romans put criminals on the cross. It was, a, it was a long ordeal. Jesus died in three hours. Some survived longer than that. But the whole issue of the, the cross was to make that person suffer, okay? And that person was up on the cross. His hands are spread out. His feet are, or his legs are bent just slightly, and it's all about suffocation. As the, as the one on the cross continues to become more fatigued, then he comes farther and farther down, and then he's not able to breathe. The only way he can breathe is by pushing up. And every push that he makes, then he can inhale. But if he doesn't push up, there's suffocation. So that's what Jesus did. He died suffering on the cross for you and I. He's, he suffocated. He could not breathe anymore. And finally at 3 p.m. he breathed his last. The suffering one. That's who we're talking about. The one who <laughs> the Bible says is the man of sorrows. Well, it brings this whole topic of the ugliness of sin, doesn't it? Why would Jesus go through that? Why would he die on the cross? Why would he do that? It's because of this. Because sin is so ugly. It is so ugly. We're told about different um, aspects of sin. Actually, in Isaiah in chapter 53, and this is interesting, sin is called sin, which he bore the sin of many. We see there in the passage But sin is essentially, when you see that word sin, it is essentially this, missing the mark. Missing the mark. Now, I don't know how many of you 
you have been watching basketball this season, but I've been enjoying actually watching the women's NCAA tournament. And I'm telling you what, there are some good players, <laughs> incredible players. And the final game is this afternoon, and, and Caitlin Clark on the, Iowa, amazing player, got player of the year. You should see her play. If you haven't seen any of those games yet, you should watch. But I'm telling you, when you think about this whole thing of missing the mark, let me give, give you an illustration, okay? Let's say that after church, we're going to go into the gym, and we're going to all try to jump and reach that 10-foot goal in the gym, okay? Now, Stephen, he's going to be able to jump pretty high. He's like, he's got 20 years younger on me, right? He's going to jump pretty high, and he may even jump higher than I do. I, I got some height on him, but you know what? I'm telling you right now, I don't think I can reach the rim. Can you hit the rim, Stephen? Sure. We'll talk after church, and you'll have to confess your sins. <laughs> some of us are taller. Some of us are shorter. But I'm guessing that most of us in here today are not going to be able to touch the rim. Maybe. But it, here, here we go. If the rim is at 12 feet, I guarantee you, not one of us in here today could touch that rim. You know what? The Bible says that God is righteous. His standard is way up here. And we can be as good as we can be and as nice as what we can be and as generous as what we could be. But the reality is that we'll never, ever reach God's standard of righteousness because he's a holy God and without sin. That's what... Isaiah is saying when we see this word sin, it's missing the mark. We just can't quite get there. In fact, we're far from God's standard of righteousness. So there's that term sin, but here's another term for sin. Isaiah says it's transgressions. It's overstepping the line. That's essentially what transgressions is. We see it three times in that passage. He was pierced for our transgression. He was stricken for for the transgression of my people. He was numbered with the transgressors. When we see that word that has to do with sin called transgressions, we need to understand that's the overstepping of the line. You go back a few years ago, okay, a lot of years ago when I was just a boy, (laughs) living right next to my grandpa's dairy farm. He had fences around the farm. He had the cattle and everything. And I was riding my bicycle one day, and my grandpa says, don't you go near that fence. Okay. You know what? There's something that was in me. It's like, I got to get near that fence. (laughs) And so I was riding my bicycle along, and all of a sudden, I was riding it right along the fence, and then all of a sudden, oh. I fell right into that fence. Have you ever tried to get out of a fence from a metal bicycle that was laying into the fence? It's not easy to do. (laughs) Grandpa actually ended up pulling me off the fence. I was like, yikes. You know what? That was a transgression. My grandpa had set the line, said, don't cross this line. Don't get near that fence. There was something in me that's like, I want to get near that fence. And I crossed the line and I paid the price. Transgression, crossing the line. There's one more word that Isaiah uses in this passage talking about sin. It's this one, iniquities. What is iniquities? Iniquities is essentially this. It's the highest level of sin. It's premeditated. It's a sin that escalates. It's plain, outright planned, premeditated disobedience. That's what iniquity is. We see it three times in the passage. He was crushed for our iniquities. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He shall bear their iniquities. When Jesus went to the cross, he bore our iniquities. He bore our transgressions. He bore our sins. You know what? There is sin And each one of us, and if it's not quickly dealt with, you know what happens? It begins raging and growing in our heart. 
That's what happens. And that's why sin can become so ugly. And this sin, this iniquity, these transgressions that are in us, they affect our relationship with God. It, it breaks that relationship with God. It breaks that relationship with others. And sin begins to enjoy the home of our heart. Max Licato is a pastor, a gifted communicator, a prolific author. He's written several books. But he's also an ordinary guy like you and I. And he shares this story when he was driving one day. And let me just read it to you. The ugly part of me showed his beastly face the other night. I was driving on a two-lane road about to become one lane. A woman in a car beside me was in the lane that continued. I was in the one that needed to merge. I needed to be ahead of her. My schedule was no doubt more important than hers. <laughs> After all, I'm not a man of the cloth, right? <laughs> Am I not a, a carrier of compassion? I'm an ambassador to peace. So what did I do? I floored it. <laughs> she did too. And when my lane ended, she was a fender ahead of me. <laughs> so I growled and let her go ahead. Over her shoulder, she gave me a sweet little bye-bye. <laughs> Err. I started to dim my headlights. Then I paused. The beastly part of me said, wait a minute. Am I not called to shed light on this dark place? To illuminate the shadows? So I put a little high beam in her rearview mirror. <laughs> she retaliated by slowing down to a crawl. This woman was mean. She couldn't have been any more meaner. She was going just 15 miles per hour, and I wasn't going to take my lights off her rearview mirror. Like two stubborn donkeys, she kept it slow, and I kept it bright. <laughs> After more unkind thoughts than I dare to confess, the road widened and I started to pass. And wouldn't you know it, a red light left us two side by side at an intersection. What happened next contains both good news and bad. The good news is she waved at me. The bad news is her wave was not the one you'd want to imitate. Moments later, conviction surfaced. Why did I do that? I'm typically a calm guy, but for 15 minutes I was a beast. Only two facts comforted me. One, I don't have a fish symbol in my car. And two, even the Apostle Paul had minor struggles, or similar struggles. I do not what I do, not what I want to do, and I do the things I hate, he said in Romans 7.15. Sin can creep right in, can it? It can grab a hold of our hearts and creep right in, and it can wreck havoc on our heart. Well, Jesus took care of all that. Do you know that? When he went to the cross as the man of sorrows, he accomplished three things there that I want to bring to your attention. And the first one is this. He accomplished peace. He brought us peace here right here and now. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. We are now with God, one with God. So here it is. Um, maybe you've heard the Navigator's Bridge illustration. Here's a, just a portion of that to help you see. I, I, I'm a very visual person, okay? And these are so good. But here you have man on one side, and he has his problem with sin, and you have God on the other side who is righteous and without sin and, and holy. So all of us start off on this one side, apart from Christ. And the Bible says sin's penalty is death. That is separation from God. And when the Bible talks about in this specific context, in Romans chapter 6, it's talking about eternal death. Being eternally separated from God, being separated from God right here and now and all through eternity. So the Bible teaches very clearly that there's a separation going on between us, between people, and between God. God is holy. We are not. God is without sin. We 
have a whole mountain full of sins. So there's a separation, right? And so many times we try to get back to God by doing good, by going to church, by reading our Bibles, by helping others. We try to make our way back to God, but you see, they all fall short. We, we cannot fully get back to God in our own strength, in our own ways. We, we just can't do it. So as much as we try, we fall short. <laughs> Remember the definition of sin? What Jesus did made all the difference. It was the game changer. Jesus said, I'm the way back to God. I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. If you want to get back to God, you have to trust me. You have to believe upon me. And what he did on the cross, you have to trust me with your life. That's what gets us back to God. So in Isaiah Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5, we see that Jesus accomplished peace. Because... At one time, apart from Christ, we are at enmity with God. We are enemies with him. We are separated from God. There's that that huge distance between us and God. And the only way we can fix that is through Jesus Christ. And thankfully, he brings us that peace. Well, we go on in the book of Isaiah in that same verse, verse 5, we also find that God brings us healing. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. We just talked about that. And with his wounds, we are healed, Isaiah says. And it's a a tremendous truth, a tremendous promise. And we need to understand, though, that the focus of the healing, as Isaiah mentions here, is not physical healing. It is spiritual healing. It is the forgiveness of our sins that is the primary thrust in this verse. You go over to uh, 1 Peter in chapter 2 and verses 24 and 25, and Peter references this very verse in Isaiah, and he ties it right in with our spiritual reconciliation with God, us coming back to God and enjoying that forgiveness that God gives us through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. God does heal, and here's this passage in Peter He himself bore our sins in his body on a tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And here we go. Peter says, by his wounds you have been healed. And then goes on to say, for you were strained like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So there's that that spiritual healing that Isaiah is focusing in on here. But again, don't get me wrong. God does heal. He heals today. He healed back then. Jesus healed countless people when he was here upon this earth. Healing is physical healing. It's something that God does. But it doesn't happen to everyone, and it doesn't happen all the time. Otherwise, we'd never die, right? (laughs) The healing, the physical healing, will eventually come in heaven. And I love that passage in Revelation chapter 21. No more crying, no more pain, no more mourning, no more sickness, no more death. That's when we'll forever be healed physically. But anyway, so there's this healing that comes, this spiritual healing that comes that Isaiah is talking about. When we trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior, guess what? We have that forgiveness. We're, we're back in connection with God. We're one with God. Aren't you thankful? Well, number three, this is something else that Jesus did on the cross. He set us free. He set us free from what? From the power of sin. In him we have redemption through his blood. That is, we have been set free from the power of sin. And then we go on and we also find that we've been set free from the penalty of sin. There it is again. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. We've been forgiven according to the riches of his grace. And by the way, I think so many times we just like, 
ignore this thing called hell. We don't dwell on it very long. We don't want to. But what is some of the punishment? To those who refuse to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, who trust what he did on the cross, we need to know that hell is very real. It is very real. Just as real as this place we're in this morning. Jesus spoke about hell often. He said, I warn you whom to fear. Fear him who after your body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Hell is a very real place. Hell is eternal. It's forever and ever and ever and ever. The devil, we see this in Revelation chapter 20 verse 10, who had deceived them, was thrown in the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night for how long? Forever and ever. And then after the devil and his angels are thrown in there, there is the judgment of unbelievers, and they are thrown in the very same lake of fire to be tormented forever and ever and ever and ever. So hell is eternal. Hell is also a place that you cannot escape by being good. You can't do it. Many people believe that they are good enough for heaven and that the only really bad people go to hell. But the Bible says this in John chapter 3 and verse 18, whoever doesn't believe that is in Jesus Christ is, are you ready for this? Condemned already. Condemned already. You cannot escape it by being good. There are no second chances. Once you're in hell, you're there forever. Remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? Lazarus, the poor beggar, who knew Jesus in a personal way, ended up in paradise. Lazarus, the unbeliever, ended up in hell. And he says these words, they're so startling. He says, (laughs) looking up to heaven, paradise, Father Abraham, please send, please send someone to cool my tongue with water. Please send someone. (laughs) And and the response was, no, it's not going to happen. You're there forever, and those are in heaven here are forever, and there's no crossing over. It's a forever thing. There are no second chances. And by the way, one final truth is heaven or hell. When we come to this whole subject of hell, it's fair. It's absolutely fair. You see, God has given us the solution to avoid hell and it's what his son Jesus did on the cross. The man of sorrows. He bore our griefs. He bore our sins. He took every one of our sins upon himself and he died in our place so we wouldn't have to. God has given us the the gift. We simply need to trust and believe and accept that gift. And if you don't, (laughs) that's on you. Not God. You see, God wants you in heaven. God desires that you go to heaven. That's why he sent his son Jesus to go through all that suffering to die for your sins and mine. You see, God loves you. He loves you immensely. He does not want you to miss out on heaven. He wishes that no one perish and go to hell. That's why he provided the solution. Have you trusted Jesus? Have you turned to Jesus? Have you allowed him to call the shots in your life? I am so thankful that we have that gift of Jesus, aren't you? (laughs) The man of sorrows. We're going to close with a song titled The Man of Sorrows. And as we sing this song, I just encourage you to listen to the words. Don't just sing it. Listen to the words 
and sing those words. And if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, I'm going to lead you in a prayer after this song so that you can get right with God. Okay? Musicians, come.